Have you ever wondered if consciousness, the very essence of your thoughts and awareness, is more than just something happening inside your head? What if it's a powerful force, capable of shaping reality itself? Imagine that the way we observe the universe, our focus and attention, doesn't just reflect the world around us, but actively influences it. Now take that thought a step further. What if divine consciousness, the infinite mind of God, is the ultimate observer, capable of shaping, sustaining, and even transforming reality at will? This idea lies at the heart of what I'd like to explore with you today, quantum neurotheology, a bold perspective that seeks to bridge science and spirituality to answer some of life's most profound questions. We live in an era where science and spirituality often seem like opposing forces. But what if they're just different lenses looking at the same truth? Quantum physics, neuroscience, and theology may seem worlds apart, but they all grapple with the same profound question. What is the nature of reality and what role does consciousness play in it? In this talk, I invite you to explore the edges of these disciplines, not as separate silos, but as interconnected fields that might illuminate something far greater. At the heart of this exploration is the idea that consciousness, our ability to observe, to focus, to be aware, is not just a passive bystander. In quantum physics, the act of observation can alter the state of a particle. In neuroscience, our thoughts and attention can change our brains. And in theology, the divine is often portrayed as the ultimate conscious observer, shaping and sustaining the cosmos. What happens when we bring these perspectives together? This brings us to a fascinating question. Could consciousness, especially divine consciousness, act as a bridge between the physical and spiritual worlds? Could it be powerful enough to sustain life even in death or to transcend the ordinary limits of time and space? And how might this help us rethink some of the most profound stories of faith, like the death and resurrection of Christ, through the lens of modern science? In this talk, we'll journey through three domains. First, quantum physics, where the strange rules of the subatomic world challenge everything we think we know about reality. Second, neuroscience, where the mysteries of consciousness blur the line between mind and matter. And third, theology, where ancient narratives of divine power and purpose might just contain echoes of truths that science is only beginning to uncover. By the end of this journey, my hope is that you'll see how these fields converge to offer a breathtaking vision of consciousness, not just as a human experience, but as a force capable of reshaping the universe itself. As we begin, I want to plant one more thought. What if reality itself is less like a machine, predictable, rigid, and more like a symphony? a dynamic interplay shaped by attention, intention, and observation. If that's the case, then perhaps Christ's resurrection, the centerpiece of Christian faith, is not just a spiritual miracle, but an invitation to see how consciousness itself can transform the fabric of existence. Let's explore this together. To begin our exploration, we turn to one of the most fascinating phenomena in quantum physics, the quantum Zeno effect. It's a principle that sounds almost too strange to be true, yet it's been demonstrated in experiments again and again. Here's how it works. When you observe a quantum system over and over again, you can prevent it from changing states. Imagine watching a pot of water on the stove and discovering that your very act of staring at it is stopping it from boiling. That's the quantum Zeno effect in a nutshell. In the quantum world, particles don't behave like tiny billiard balls following set paths. Instead, they exist in states of possibility, a superposition of outcomes, until they are measured or observed. But here's the twist. If you observe them frequently enough, you can freeze them into one of those states, halting their natural progression. It's as if your observation overrides their potential to evolve. At its core, the quantum Zeno effect tells us that observation isn't passive, it's active. It shapes what happens next. Now let's step back for a moment. What does this mean for consciousness? If observation can shape reality on the smallest scales, could it also play a role in larger, more complex systems? Could the power of an observer, a being capable of sustained intentional focus, extend beyond particles to living systems, even to life and death itself? This brings us to a profound theological question. If human observation has this kind of power in the quantum world, what about divine observation? What happens when the ultimate observer, a being of infinite consciousness and will, focuses on the material world? 
Could this explain how Christ's divine nature sustained his body in the tomb, defying the ordinary laws of decay? To explore this, we turn to the idea of soul stasis. In the Christian tradition, Christ's death is not the end of the story. After his crucifixion, his body is placed in a tomb, yet scripture tells us something extraordinary. His body did not undergo decay. For three days, his body lay in a state of suspension, not alive in the biological sense, yet not succumbing to the natural processes of death. How can we make sense of this? Here's where the quantum Zeno effect offers an intriguing analogy. Imagine that Christ's divine consciousness, his perfect awareness, acted as the ultimate observer. By maintaining a continuous focus on his physical form, his divine nature could have prevented his body from transitioning to the natural state of decay. In this view, his consciousness is not bound by the limitations of human biology but operates on a level that can override entropy itself. This idea aligns with Christian theology, which holds that Christ's divine nature remained united with his human body and soul even in death. Unlike ordinary consciousness which might flicker or wane, divine consciousness is unbroken, infinite, and all-encompassing. In this state, Christ's observation of his own body could function as a kind of divine pause button, sustaining the physical form in a state of perfect stasis. The Christian tradition tells us that while Christ's body lay entombed in a state of stasis, his soul embarked on a journey into the depths of the underworld, a moment known as the harrowing of hell. This was not a passive waiting period, but an active confrontation with the forces of darkness, a battle for the redemption of souls. Yet what does such a journey look like when framed not just theologically, but also through the lenses of consciousness and altered states? Consider this. While the physical body remained untouched by decay, Christ's mind, or more accurately his soul, entered a state that resonates with experiences described by mystics, meditators, and individuals who have undergone near-death or profound psychedelic experiences. These are moments when ordinary perceptions dissolve, and the boundaries of self seem to expand into realms of vivid imagery, profound connection, or intense struggle. It's as if the mind steps outside the normal flow of time and space, engaging in something far deeper, far more primal. To pause for a moment on the physical, the concept of stasis here aligns with the quantum Zeno effect, a perfect observation preventing decay. But this state is not merely physical. It is integrally connected to the consciousness observing it. For Christ, this would have been the divine consciousness, infinite in its capacity to sustain. His body is perfectly still, perfectly at rest, held in a divine equilibrium that denies entropy its claim. Meanwhile, his soul embarks on a radically different journey. Now let's turn our attention inward. Many accounts of near-death experiences describe a split between the physical body and the conscious mind where the latter travels to strange and often challenging realms. In some traditions, this state is called samadhi, a profound meditative absorption where the individual confronts the limits of the self and often experiences encounters with what feel like otherworldly beings. Similarly, those who have undergone intense psychedelic experiences, whether induced by substances like DMT or in natural states of deep trance, report vivid, sometimes terrifying visions. They describe encounters with figures that feel archetypal guardians, tormentors, demons, or guides. For Christ, this experience would not have been a mere byproduct of brain chemistry, but a deliberate, purposeful descent into the metaphysical depths. This was not a journey for his sake, but for ours, a battle fought on behalf of the souls trapped in torment. Imagine the experience as an infinite expansion of consciousness, simultaneously absorbing the pain and alienation of all humanity while engaging with the forces of darkness that seek to hold us captive. This is the soul confronting torment not as an illusion but as a lived reality and then transforming it through the power of divine love and will. Reports from mystical and near-death states often include themes of duality, light and darkness, life and death, self and other. These states are frequently described as a battle, not against external forces but within the self. In Christ's case, we might imagine a cosmic scale version of this struggle not an internal psychological battle, but an externalized spiritual confrontation with the very forces of sin, death, and despair. What is remarkable is that in states like near-death experiences or psychedelic visions, 
the line between hallucination and reality dissolves. Participants describe these experiences as more real than ordinary life. If this is true for human consciousness, how much more profound must it have been for Christ's divine human consciousness? For him, the battle in the depths was not symbolic, it was existential. It was the ultimate act of love, a deliberate confrontation with the torment of the human condition undertaken to free us from its grip. Even as this battle rages in the spiritual realm, Christ's divine consciousness maintains its unbroken link to his physical body. The two realms, the material and the spiritual, are unified by the perfect observation of the divine mind. It is this unbroken connection that allows Christ's soul to engage in redemption while his body remains in perfect stasis. In this way, the stasis of the body is not a passive waiting but an active, dynamic interplay, a pause in one realm that enables action in another. And then just as suddenly as the stasis began, it ends. The battle is won. The forces of torment are defeated and the souls of the righteous are redeemed. What happens next is nothing less than a reintegration, a resurrection. The divine consciousness shifts from stasis to transformation and the body, no longer merely sustained, is glorified. But this is not the end of the story. It is the beginning of something entirely new, a new kind of existence, both for Christ and for all who follow him. And that is where we will turn next. Up to this point, we've explored Christ's stasis as a dual phenomenon, his body held in perfect suspension and his soul actively descending into the depths. But what connects these two realms? The answer lies in consciousness, not just as a human experience, but as a divine force that bridges the physical and spiritual. This is where neuroscience, theology, and even quantum theory converge, offering us a glimpse into the nature of consciousness as both a connector and a creator. Some scientists suggest that consciousness might operate at a quantum level, engaging with the fabric of reality in ways we don't yet fully understand. The penrose hameroff orcher theory, for example, posits that quantum processes in the brain's microtubules might underlie our conscious experience. What's fascinating here is the implication that consciousness, this mysterious intangible awareness, could influence material reality. If this is true on a human level, imagine the implications for divine consciousness, which is infinite, unbroken, and omniscient. Christ's divine human consciousness represents the pinnacle of this bridge. Unlike our limited awareness, fragmented by distraction and bias, his consciousness operates with perfect clarity and intention. During his stasis, this awareness not only sustains his body, but actively participates in the spiritual realm, redeeming souls. In this sense, Christ is the ultimate observer, not merely watching, but actively shaping reality through his infinite will and love. Let's take this further. Neurotheological dynamics suggest that the soul, our innermost essence, functions not in isolation but in constant interplay with the mind and body. In Christ's case, this interplay is magnified to a cosmic scale. His soul's descent into the depths isn't a departure from his body, it's part of a continuous feedback loop where the spiritual and physical remain united through the divine mind. Consider human experiences of profound meditation or altered states of consciousness where the mind seems to step outside the body yet remains tethered to it. These states often lead to profound psychological or even physiological effects, slowed heart rates, altered brain waves, and sometimes healing. Could this be a small-scale reflection of what Christ experienced, where his soul's journey into the depths simultaneously preserved and transformed his physical form? This interplay between the physical and spiritual in Christ is beautifully captured in the theological concept of the hypostatic union, the inseparable union of his divine and human natures. Neurotheologically, we might see this as a model for the ultimate integration of body, mind, and spirit, sustained by the divine consciousness that bridges all realms. At the heart of the Christian faith is the resurrection, the moment when Christ rises from the dead, not simply restored to life, but transformed into a glorified state. This is not a return to the old, but the emergence of something entirely new. To frame this in quantum terms, it's as if the stasis that held Christ's body in suspension was not just a pause, but a preparation for a profound state transition, a collapse into a higher reality. In quantum mechanics, the collapse of the wave function represents the moment when a system's potential becomes a single, observable reality. Analogously, Christ's resurrection can be seen as the divine consciousness shifting focus from sustaining the stasis of his body to transforming it into something new. 
This is a reintegration where body, soul, and spirit are not merely reunited but glorified. What's remarkable about the resurrection is its dual nature. It maintains continuity with the old while introducing something entirely new. Christ's body is still His, it bears the wounds of the crucifixion, but it now transcends ordinary physical limitations. He appears in locked rooms, yet He eats with His disciples. He is recognizable yet transformed. This paradox of continuity and change reflects the idea that divine consciousness not only preserves but elevates reality. Here's where this idea touches us. The resurrection is not just an isolated event, it's a model for what human life can become when touched by divine consciousness. In lesser forms, we see echoes of this in our own experiences, moments of profound transformation where we feel renewed, reconnected, or elevated. Psychologically, these are moments of reintegration when fragmented parts of ourselves come together into a more harmonious whole. From a neurotheological perspective, the resurrection might be seen as the ultimate example of reintegration, a process where the body, mind, and soul are not just restored, but glorified. In human terms, this is akin to reaching a state of profound spiritual awakening, where the self transcends ordinary limitations to participate in something greater. For Christ, this is not just a personal transformation, but a cosmic one, opening the door for all humanity to follow. Finally, the resurrection is not just about Christ, it's about the entire cosmos. In theological terms, Christ's resurrection marks the beginning of a new creation, where death is no longer the final word. In quantum terms, it's as if the universe itself undergoes a shift, a reconfiguration that allows for new possibilities. This is the ultimate reintegration where the material and the spiritual, the human and the divine are brought into perfect harmony. So what does this mean for us today? If Christ's resurrection is the ultimate reintegration of body, soul and spirit, then it's also an invitation. It invites us to explore the interconnectedness of our own lives to see how consciousness, observation, and intention can shape not just our inner world but the reality around us, and it invites us to imagine a universe where the boundaries between science and faith dissolve, revealing a deeper, unified truth. This is the promise of resurrection, not just as a past event but as a present and future reality for all of us.